You are listening to episode 34 of The Lewis and Kyle Show with Audriel Lubarski. 85% of jobs come from networking. There's this hidden job market people like to talk about, which is things that are not posted. There's even the jobs that are posted are almost always going to go to the person who reached out to the hiring manager or someone else at the company or whatever. You've got to network and you've got to do it on both cylinders. Hello and welcome to The Lewis and Kyle Show, an interview podcast where Lewis and I are documenting our journey while we're learning about entrepreneurship, investing, self-education, and fitness through interviews with inspiring mentors. Today, we have somebody who's covered all of those four topics really well, Adriel Lewarski. Lewis, why don't you introduce him a little bit? Sure. So Adriel saw him to our friend Joe Puccio, who we brought on in episode 16, the creator of Course School introduced us to. We asked him if he knew anybody we should be talking to. He, right off the bat, said we got to talk to his friend Adriel because he's met probably more people than anyone else Joe's ever known. Adriel had this period where he was unemployed and he knew that, you know, more often than not, jobs come from people, not from just applying to millions of things on the internet. So he figured if he could meet as many people as possible through full-time networking as an unemployed person, he'd be more likely to have access to cool opportunities. But in that period of productive unemployment for him made him realize that other people would probably benefit from being inspired to take on similar projects. And that's what led him to start the company he talks about in this interview, Riveter, which basically is exactly that, a company that provides resources and education and discounts to personal development resources for people who are unemployed to grow themselves and be more likely to get exciting opportunities. And you can really feel through this interview and, and through his passion, just how much he cares about this period of time and, and how he believes that it can be something that's transformative for for unemployed people. You know, most of the time people think about being unemployed as a, as a horrible time. It's like, you don't have any money, you, you're really scrambling. But what he believes is that it can be a, a time of growth and a time for you to be able to to make yourself the person that you can be in order to, to get the job that you want or, or be the person that you want. And that's what Riveter's trying to do is to supply these people that are unemployed with the opportunities to, to make that happen. And it's, it's a really cool conversation and I'm excited for you all to listen to it. Hey, Adriel, thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited to chat with you. All right, the Lewis and Kyle show. This is fun. So first question, and this is the first time I've opened the show with someone's Instagram bio as a question, but I really like your bio and I was hoping you could explain it for us. It says, sometimes I believe in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. What, what do you mean by that? Like, what, is, what does that mean? Why is that your, like your tagline on social media? Oh, we're getting into this earlier than I would have expected. It's Alice in Wonderland, Lewis. It's Alice in Wonderland. It's one of my favorite quotes from my all-time favorite book. I believe in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. If we were in my uh, home in California, you'd actually see an engraved piece of wood where I carve that and I keep it next to my desk at all times. I think to me, I believe in as many as six impossible things before breakfast means there's very little that you know for sure. There's very little that is set in stone. There's very little that you cannot accomplish if you really want to do it. And a little bit of whimsicalness, a little bit of adventure, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of shooting for the stars uh, takes you a long way. And it's just, it's a quote that stuck with me for a very, very long time since the first time I read that book. And I will, I will preach it and shatter it off the rooftops until I'm blue in the face. Well, I was, I was willing to give you credit for that quote, but. <laughs> <laughs> not, not as clever as Lewis Carroll, unfortunately. Okay. Well, that's uh, interesting the way you framed that in terms of kind of the first set of questions you want to ask you about uncertainty and possibility. And a lot of that is related to unemployment, which is where we want to spend the first section of this show talking about, you know, the company you started going through what your experience was that led you to create this company. And then some of like, know the content and the actual ideas that you're promoting to the company but could you walk us kind of to what Riveter is and how it got started related starting at you know your joint journey being unemployed sure so Riveter is HR for the unemployed uh, we negotiate discounted and free access to resources that help people turn unemployment into the most positive and productive period of their lives where it started there's a few different ways to approach the journey the slightly slightly shorter version is the fact that my last job was in self-driving cars. I loved it. I thought it was the most interesting work in the world. We were building self-driving delivery cars. We were really good at it. We had the first big commercial deals in the entire autonomous vehicle industry. We had cars on the road actually making money before anyone else in the industry. And it was a lot of fun. I once got a call 
uh, from somebody who left a message. And the message was when I listened to it later is, Hey, Adriel, this is John. I've been a UPS driver for 30 years. I saw your car on the road, your self-driving delivery car. And I wish you guys all luck, but I got to let you know, it scared the shit out of me. And I hope you guys succeed. Hope everyone does well, but I want you to know you're going to take away a lot of jobs. Good luck. And he left me that message and it really, it, it really shook me. Um, this was in the spring of 2018. I called him back. We talked on the phone. I actually offered him a job to come work for us. He was very anti-robot and didn't want to. But it, it led me down a path of reading a lot, learning a lot, talking a lot about you know, Silicon Valley favorite of automation, the future of work, the question of, well, what happens when a factory in Eastern Michigan where cars were made is, and 8,000 people used to work is shut down because all of a sudden you could do that same job with 80 people and a bunch of robots. What happens to those jobs? What happens to those communities? What happens to those people? Because those jobs aren't coming back. Those are all of a sudden done by robots and more and more will be done faster and faster by automation. So learning about all this late last year through a series of books, the most influential one of which was AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee. I started thinking about, well, how do you take care of these people who are being impacted by automation at a rate faster than that anybody can adapt to, at a rate faster than you could just reskill for, at a rate faster than you can make the argument that, oh, it's okay, like a truck driver whose job is automated away by an autonomous trucking company, they'll just learn to be a UX designer or they'll have to reskill and work in customer service. I think that's the most ridiculous thing. I don't know if you guys have ever met a truck driver, but you're not going to put them into a customer service job. You're not going to retrain them to be a tech salesperson. You're just not going to do that. These people are being impacted and they're not going to adapt as quickly as techno utopias might say. So early this year in about January, we started talking to a lot of unemployed people before COVID, believe it or not, started talking to a lot of unemployed people, a lot of people whose jobs were automated away, talking about their problems. In early March, still before COVID, we said, all right, let's do this. Let's found a company that helps uh, the people most impacted by AI and robotics by connecting them to the companies and people who are most benefited by AI and robotics. And we're going to do that by negotiating a lot of discounts by making life cheaper for unemployed people, by giving them access to better resources, by giving them a positive community, by redefining the value that they bring in a society. And we started doing that in March. The day we launched, or the day we kind of agreed, COVID was not a thing. About a week later, there were rumors of COVID. And about two weeks later, a million people were laid off. Uh, and that number only continued to go. Well, it's certainly a good time to start a company for unemployed people. You know, that, that exponential graph that you can look at for the March and April unemployment, the fact that you're right before that is crazy. And I totally agree, you know, like automation is coming and going from coal to code is just not a, a realistic thing that's going to happen. But you had a period of unemployment before your job with, with the self-driving car company, right? And that had a very... It was very impactful for you. So can you tell us a little bit about that period of time and how you maximize your time being unemployed and, and maybe how you felt when that guy called you and told you that you're going to change the world for a lot of people's like they, they might be unemployed because of the work that you're doing. Yeah. So about four -ish years ago, I was working on a startup and it failed and I moved back into my parents. Well, first I traveled around South America for about five weeks and then I moved back into my parents. And I told myself that I'm not going to get a job for six months. I just made that promise myself. I finished the startup in June. We wound it down. Uh, I told myself I'm not getting another job in that year. And the reason I did that is because I noticed a lot of my friends, especially those who took more traditional paths out of college and finance or, or consulting or graduate schools, a lot of them just went from thing to thing to thing and didn't speak with the same enthusiasm that I would like to be speaking about my work, about my impact, about what mattered to me. They had a lot of other things going for it. And I get a lot of shit from my friends fairly often for talking like this, but uh, they weren't quite speaking in the way I wanted to be speaking about things. So I told myself, I'm going to be unemployed, happily, gainfully unemployed for six months. And in that time, 
all I did was learn and talk to people. I had a podcast just like you guys. And every single week I was trying to release it. I just started taking classes, picked up skills, started a little, wouldn't even call it a company, a little project marketing for com comedy clubs. Cause I always loved comedy and it was fun. And I, I wanted to help them out and I wanted to learn to use WordPress over the period of that first four months when I was doing probably 30 hours a week of networking, I, I just tried to understand myself more. I tried to figure out what my impact should be. I tried to figure out what was important to me. And it was, some days it was fantastic. You know, I had a great day where I'd, I'd wake up, I'd eat breakfast, I'd exercise, I'd read, I'd go to an event, I'd meet cool people, I'd put out a podcast. I felt great. I'd, I'd read good books. It was awesome. Some days were brutal. I mean, some days you just wake up and you're like, shit, it's Wednesday. I don't really know what to be doing with my time, but I told myself I got to keep going. And in that period of time, I was able to narrow what it was I wanted to work on next as much as possible. And I set very clear parameters for myself. At that time, what I'd set because of, uh, I told myself I wanted to work in transportation, ideally self-driving cars. I'd been in some really bad car accidents before, uh, two that almost killed me, a couple more that left a couple bruises. And I told myself transportation is important. Startups are important. Making an impact on people's lives is valuable. And the best way I could do that is by finding a job in New York or in San Francisco in transportation, ideally self-driving cars, at a startup that has fewer than 20 people and more than $2 million raised. I was very specific. And when you're that specific, you've only got a couple of options. I was very fortunate enough to get a job purely through networking with one of those options. I moved out to the Bay Area uh, in early January to work on that. What I take from that experience is that and I should also admit, I mean, I have a much higher risk profile than, than many others. I think there's some receptors missing in my brain for what makes sense in life. But what I take from that is patience leads to a lot of good things that understanding yourself and taking the time to really know what it is you value and you care about is one of the best investments you can make for your career. Because my professional life really began to take a positive turn after this period of time in which I got to say, what matters to me? What should I be spending my time on? So, you know, now that I work in the unemployment space, trying to figure out how can I help people figure out what matters to them? How can I help people spend this period of time of unemployment, which in good economies often lasts four to six months anyway? The answer needs to be that patience matters, that introspection matters, that the people around you matter, and trying to create the infrastructure for people to be able to navigate this period of time a lot more cleanly, a lot more successfully than I ever did is, is a task that both from my own experience personally and also from more academic things, just learning, watching, reading, uh, I'm proud to be doing. That's awesome. I like that whole story beginning to end. It was just a really motivating and shows some of the clear reasons why you're the right person to be in this situation and give some explanation to, you know, you didn't just come up with this out of thin air and it wasn't because of COVID. And obviously we debunked that hypothesis just with the, the chronology of things. Otherwise you would just be doing very, very well as a uh, predictor of the impossible. But so how do you kind of translate some of those ideals or those practices through your company to encourage people to engage in productive introspection and identify those best fit opportunities for them and those I next steps that are logical for them to be taking to maximize their unemployment the same way as you did. Yeah. Well, one of the first important things, just taking a step back and talking about startups is the, the eagerness of founders to do too much. And I fall into this trap as often as anybody else. When you are passionate about something, you think you have every idea about how to fix that thing. You think you've got the answers and you got a couple, hopefully, otherwise you're working on something wrong but stretching yourself too thin and fixing too many problems at once, all driven by passion and enthusiasm and, and you know, customer feedback is dangerous, is risky. You're gonna stretch yourself too thin and people will come to you. You're only gonna be, you know, you're you, a founder or two, before you raise any money, even when you raise money, maybe added a couple of people. People need to come to you and they need to know what they're gonna get from you. So there's a lot of ideas that we have that we're not doing, we're not going to be doing, but we really wanna be doing. Among them, you know, we want to create a Google Calendar for the unemployed, which has to click and drag boxes of way to spend your time. We want to create accountability circles where people can get together for daily stand-ups and support each other through unemployment, find positivity, things like that. All these different product series that we would love to work on, but we're not. The one thing we do 
the one message we want to get across to anyone considering becoming one of our users is that we negotiate free and discounted accesses to resources that will help you turn unemployment into a positive and productive experience. So the way we do all the things that I want to be doing, the one way we do that is when you log on, you see these four categories, wellness, education, finance, and career. We say these are the four pillars of unemployment. And along that is a foundation of actually your unemployment basics. Did you apply for unemployment? Did you get health insurance? You know, you can't be successful unless you've taken care of the basics. So you got this foundation of unemployment and health insurance, but then you got these four pillars, wellness, education, finance, and career. And in each one of those, we're working with the best companies in those spaces to get our members, unemployed people, a discount or free access to their services. We go to BetterHelp, the top therapy company in the country. And we said, hey, Unemployed people need your service, but they can't, they shouldn't be paying for it. They need you to help them out. So they said, okay, great. Any Riveter member gets a month free plus a 30% discount for eternity because we're here to support you. In education, we went to Udemy, the top online class company. And we said, hey, education isn't as important for anyone as it is for somebody unemployed who's trying to prove themselves, who's trying to upskill, who's trying to change career paths but they can't afford your high prices. So they took 85% off dozens and dozens of courses. And same thing with a bunch of other educators. And same thing in the finance space, we have budgeting apps that you normally have to pay for every month that are free. We have financial advisors who will work with you and give you a free two hour consultation that normally costs hundreds of dollars. In the career space from resume writers to uh, networking events, which cost 80 bucks a month, but we went to them and said, nobody needs you more. Nobody can benefit more from you than unemployed people, but you've got to support them. You've got to help them out so that they can get themselves out of this tough situation using your resource. And they all said, yes. So that's the approach we're taking. We're saying there's a million things we want to be doing, but the one thing we do is we're going to get unemployed people discounts to things that'll help them live more positively and productively. So are you actively, do all of these things work together cumulatively to try to get them back into the workforce? The hope is yes. So actually, uh, you know, I was two minutes late to this call and that's because I was on the phone with a user and the user was telling me, hey, I love your site, cool resources, used one of them. I'm confused. Where do I add my resume? Right? Where, do I, where do I get in touch with the recruiter who's going to get me a job? And my answer was, hey, we don't do that yet. We're not actively trying to help you get a job. There's a million companies that do that. And that's super counterintuitive, Kyle. And I don't know if it's right or wrong. You know, I'm, I'm still waiting to be proven wrong on this one. But my thought was this, every tech company in the recruiting space in the world has a box that said, upload your resume. We'll be shared with a thousand recruiters at leading companies. We work with Google, Dropbox, Facebook, and, and they do that. <laughs> you upload your resume and you never hear back because 50,000 other people uploaded their resume this week and 50,000 other people haven't heard back. So we said, we are not going to be doing that. We're going to be doing the exact opposite. Everyone's zigging. We're going to zag. And... So when you ask the question of, do all these things help people get a job? All these things, we're not going to put your name in a box to help you get a job. But we're saying this, Kyle, if you're unemployed and you come to us, you know, or we are telling you that if you take care of your wellness, if you take classes and certify and tell your story, if your finances are in a good position, and if you do what's important for your career, which is networking, 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 and you do it in a lot of groups, and you take care, you fix your resume and you do that well, then you will be in a position to get the job. But if you go talk to a recruiter and you pay a thousand bucks to a recruiter, but uh, you're distracted because you're sick, you're not sure if you're going to make next month's rent, you have the same skill set you had a year ago, and you haven't met anyone because you've just been sitting there in front of your computer applying to jobs, you're also not going to get a job. So we're letting all the other companies focus on that interaction, that interface with companies, putting uh, candidates in front of companies, and we're going to take care of the foundational, how do you live your life? How do you spend your time when you're unemployed? It's a, it's a bet. Uh, it's a bet. And we'll see if it's uh, the right one or a wrong one. No, I really like that, Amos. It's identifying a potential bottleneck in the space and not, there's no value in providing the same value as everyone else. You know, you can just as easily find the best companies that do recruiting in a way that you're ideologically on the same page with and just have that become a partner or a referral or something like that. So it makes a ton of sense. 
One of your previous guests, Wes Cow, who who's awesome, Kao, Wes Kao, I think, she was talking on your podcast about being spiky, right? You got to be spiky. You got to have one thing that's like, what the heck is that spike sticking out of their head? Uh, if you're well-rounded, that's not super helpful because everyone's well-rounded and, and people are just going to, you know, water's going to wash over you. But if you're spiky, if you got this one weird thing, at least you'll attract somebody. You know, at least you're going to get somebody's attention. The self-driving car thing was the same thing. I joined the self-driving car industry, but it was frothier than ever. Everybody was raising a billion dollars. Everybody said self-driving. Every, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Volkswagen, Google, Amazon, Apple. Everyone said self-driving cars actively on the road by 2020. We said we are not going to be a self-driving car moving people. We are not moving people. We're never moving people. Everyone said, what? You got to move people. We said, absolutely not. We are moving boxes. We are moving things. And even within things, we got spike here. We said, we don't move anything. We're not moving food. We're not doing burritos. We did groceries for a little bit and decided we don't like it. We're not doing that. We move auto parts. We are a self-driving delivery company for the auto parts industry. We had one spike. We said, all we do is this. And that's where we found success. Everybody else was the well-rounded. We're the self-driving everything company. Our AI stack is going to be better than your AI stack. We said, we're not fighting that fight. Everyone else is going to have their bloodbath over here. And we're going to be this one person saying this one message. And we are the self-driving delivery car company. And I hope to be able to do the same thing uh, here with Riveter, which is everybody is fighting this bloodbath of can we get people jobs? Can we get people jobs? Which is incredibly important and incredibly challenging. So we're saying we're not going to win there. We could be clever. We could win a couple of customers, but we're never going to beat companies who have been trying to do this for decades. We got to do something different. And if we do that different thing well enough, then eventually we'll be able to, to branch out into the other stuff. But our goal is not to be better. It's to be different. So, so what does the long-term vision look like for that? Because, I mean, it sounds like you've done a fairly good job in the short term of past six to, say, six to eight months of landing some very clearly positively beneficial discounts in those four pillars of well-being and productivity during unemployment. Uh, but what's the long-term goal look like for that? Like five years out, let's say. Yeah, I think there's... I'll assume that we're not in a pandemic five years from now. Hey, fingers crossed, man. I think there's two sides of the spectrum there. On the one hand, I want unemployment to be almost like being a student or a veteran. I want you to be able, you know, when you're in college, you show your student ID to any restaurant or any museum, and they're going to give you 10% off. They're going to give you the student discount. You'll get a bus pass on the student discount, all that stuff. Why? Students are terrible customers. Students have no money. Students... Students are the worst customers in the world. The answer is not because we like students. The answer is because students have potential. The answer is because if you take care of students at a time when they have zero kinetic energy, because they're crappy little customers who are whiny and don't have any money, but they're all potential because they're going to grow into these amazing citizens who have salaries. If we take care of them now, then they'll come back to us later. I want our employment to do the same thing. And people to recognize people who are unemployed they're working their hardest to be reemployed. They need a hand for this period of time, and they should be able to walk into any museum, any theme park, any restaurant, any coffee shop, flash their Riveter ID and say, I need a hand, and you agreed to give me a hand because I'm a citizen in your community, because you want my business now, and you want my business in the future, because we're all in this together, and they get 10, 20, 50% off of the product. That's the one hand. And I want that to be at local coffee shops. I want it to be at museums. I want that to be everywhere you can think. On the other hand, I want the biggest companies in the world to recognize. I want AT&T, I want Google, I want Spotify, I want Netflix, I want Disney to recognize that all the technology that they're working on is incredible, is valuable, is freeing up our time in ways it never has before. But society does not evolve as quickly as technology does. People who are going to be affected by AI and robotics are not going to all of a sudden find this new society that's understanding of the fact that it's getting harder and harder to get their next job because their skills need to develop faster and faster at rates that a system cannot actually support. I want those massive companies to do two things. The first is I want every single one of them to give a discount to unemployed people. I want AT&T to tell all of their customers that, hey, if you are a customer, not if you're a new customer or some sort of new customer acquisition strategy. No, if you are an AT&T customer and you lose your job, we've got your back. You get three months off of our service. No questions asked. 
we're taking care of you because we know we need you. That's the first thing. And I want, I want Spotify to give you three months free. I want Netflix to say, hey, relax, man. I know you got a tough time. I know there's a lot of negativity. Watch some free movies. It's our treat. Thanks for being our customer for the last five years. More importantly, thanks for being our customer for the next 20 years. And that's how, co- that's how companies, how the brands win immense loyalty. So that's the first thing. Brands give discounts to unemployed people. The second thing is that we started a conversation in this country around value in a way that is not tied to GDP, value in a way that is not tied to employment numbers, value in a way that is not tied purely to your economic give back. And listen, my parents come from, ran away from communist Russia. I was born in Ardent and raised an Ardent capitalist. I'm not vying for a kibbutz to all live on. I'm arguing that as technology, as capitalism moves faster than society can handle, we need another way to value people. One of my all-time favorite quotes is from Bobby Kennedy, JFK's younger, cooler brother. And he's talking about GDP and talking about how GDP is not enough of a metric for what matters in a country. GDP, he says, GDP, it, 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 it's a measurement of you know, our, the carnage on our highways and air pollution and cigarette advertising. That's all going into GDP. The number of rifles sold in a country, the number of Big Macs eaten, that's going into GDP. But you know what's not going into GDP? Not the health of our children, or the quality of education, or the joy of their play, the beauty of our poetry, the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debates, what it means to be a parent. And he says, neither our wit nor our courage, our wisdom nor our learning, our compassion nor our devotion to our country measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. So Lewis, when you say, what is our goal in five years? Maybe that's too broad of a goal, but I want to make sure we are at the forefront of a conversation that says what matters for our country, what matters for our citizens, what matters for our world, besides what is your salary, Kyle? How much money did you make this year, Lewis? It is, how are you as a community member? Where have you volunteered? Where have you given your time? Are you a good parent? What have you done to be a good neighbor? What have you done to bring art into the world? What have you done to share the story? That is part of the conversation we want to be in over the next five to 50 years. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, Adriel, like for real. I think that it's important. And I think that GDP is, is like a metric that was created, I think, during wartime to, and it was just made up and it's like a, a production function, but it's increasingly less, less prescriptive of, of what our society actually looks like in today's world. And that's something that Andrew Yang talks about when he kind of preaches, you know, a, a similar thing just along the lines of, of UBI. But I like that you said it was made up. I think that's so important. One like thing that's been, is always existed in my life is a recognition that everything is made up. Everything. No one, everything is made up by people. Have you read Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari? Yeah. Add it to the list, Kyle. Lewis, I'm glad you have. His whole point is everything we have is a story. Mm-hmm. Religion's a story, an important story. Economics is a story, an important story. Careers are a story, a relevant story. Everything is a story. So if everything is a story, and we all admit that prosperity or career goals or wearing a brand name jacket, all of that is a story, well, then we can continue to write different stories. We can continue to write stories that matter in different ways. You saying that GDP is made up is exactly right. And it's relevant. It's not, a, it's not an irrelevant number, but it also means we can make up other metrics. Mm-hmm. We can make up other things that matter to us. I don't know how to have all the answers about what those other things are, but I know they need to be made up or we're in big trouble. And I think the realization that you know, things are made up kind of empowers people to be able uh, to think that they can make things up too. And you know, they can change the world around them. It's like the Steve Jobs quote about, Like once you realize that when you poke the world, things change, you know, everything changes for you. But I wanted to ask you, let's say tomorrow I'm unemployed and I'm trying to, you know, get my life in order. What do you think the, the one thing that I can do that by doing which everything else becomes easier or irrelevant that I should do as an unemployed person? Join Riveter. (laughs) There you go. Two more answers, Kyle. <laughs> too easy, too easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I think um, I'm going to answer that in, in 
two things you need to do because I think it's important. The first is you got to take care of the basics. You've got to apply for unemployment. You've got to figure out your health insurance. And you've got to figure out your financial plan. So that's one. That's take care of the basics. Like too many people who I talk to forgot about their own insurance expiring, their health insurance expiring. They just didn't feel like applying for unemployment because they didn't even know if they qualify. The answer is yes, you qualify. The answer is yes, you've earned that money and the right to that money. The answer is yes, health insurance is important and complicated and shitty in America, but you've got to figure it out. So that's number one is take care of the basics. But the second thing, if I were just to say broadly, the one thing you need to be doing is you need to be figuring out what is going to make you stand out and how are you going to tell that story? The answer is not work on your resume. The answer is sort of network. The answer is sort of take care of your health and sort of take classes. But more than anything, the answer is what is going to make Kyle a different and a better applicant and person and citizen than anyone else. For many people, for some people I've talked, and this could be a million things. One person I talked to decided that her passion is sports and she wants to give her time to sports related nonprofits. So she works every day volunteering at sports related nonprofits. Some days she's coaching a little league, other days she's working on a marketing campaign. Someone else I talked to decided to start a podcast and he's turning like video games into stories via podcast and he's learning to edit the whole thing and that makes him different. That's the guy who is going to talk about, hey, what'd you do in unemployment? I learned to edit audio. I learned to tell stories. I learned to ask questions and interview people. So the one thing you need to do is figure out what is going to make me different. What's your side project? Somebody I was just talking to today, one of our users started volunteering for Code for America. And he's now working with the LA Brigade, volunteering for Code for America. And that makes him different because he is building skills, because he's giving relevant skills, because he's giving back to his community. And he knows that if he does that long enough, he's going to stand out in any interview because he's gonna have an interesting story. And the second aspect of that is you gotta learn to tell that story of what's making you different. So you could volunteer, you could start a company, you could start a podcast, you could could learn to break dance, all that is awesome, but you've gotta be able to tell that story. You gotta say, hey, when I was unemployed, every single day for two hours a day, I took break dancing classes, and that is fine. But you gotta make sure you're on LinkedIn, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, and you're posting videos of yourself break dancing, you're saying why it's important, you're saying what it's given to you, And you're saying, this is why I am a great candidate. I'm a great person. I'm a great value add because I was able to commit to something on my own. I was able to put something on my own shoulders and I was able to be a different candidate than anyone else you've seen. This is comes back to what I said earlier. It's don't be better, be different. You spoke to so many good good points there. One point I really want to emphasize, and this is something I've thought about recently is since I've been putting a lot of attention into unrelated physical challenges, you know, whether that's endurance running or training for calisthenics or something is there are, it doesn't have to be, you know, your professional story that's interesting in a job interview or whatever. It doesn't have to be that you spent all this time pursuing a very specific relevant professional skill, like video editing or audio editing or coding. Like it demonstrates a lot of these similar skill sets and character traits to have had the discipline to follow an 18 week training plan and then follow through and like finish the race at the time you set out especially, and again, framing it in terms of stories, right, as yourself as the unlikely hero at the beginning of the story, being that person who no one would have thought, you know, you had no experience, you're never an athlete, or again, you've never danced in your whole life, everyone's made fun of you, so you're like, well, I've got nothing going on, Riveter hooked me up at the dance studio, I'm going to learn how to do flares, and like, just, which is, I'm going to get back to you, Adriel, in a couple months, because I'm working on my flares, I'm going to get there eventually. I feel like you've got potential, I see some menus. No, I mean, I'm the middle split. Once I get the middle split down, then I'm going to focus on players because it's kind of pointless to focus on until to that point. But again, Riveter got you in the studio. You've taken breakdancing classes. You've amassed a small following on Twitter. You've got 5,000 people that look to you as the authority in the breakdancing space. Like That demonstrates a lot of really beneficial things about you that no matter what the position are certainly going to make you the, the candidate that's remembered after an interview. And there's also the flip side of that is whatever you do, you know, we're talking about breakdancing facetiously, but I'm serious. If that's the passion, if that's the thing that got you pumped, then that's fantastic. And just because you started breakdancing doesn't mean you can't get another VP of sales job at a tech company. It just means you're going to have a different story to tell about how you, you know, your version of the story needs to be how you grew your Instagram following at a 10K or whatever. 
right? So the thing you should be doing when you, when you first lose your job and you do all the basics and you've gone through the, you know, 12, 12 step program of emotions and you're thinking, you're sitting there with your cup of coffee and your journal and you're saying, what is the thing that I'm going to commit myself to? Because this is going to, for me, this is going to last three to six months. You've got to admit that. You can't say, oh, I'll be done in two weeks. Because when you're not done in two weeks and you're not done in a month, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be upset. You're going to be near depression. You need to say, for me, this is going to last three to six months. And this is how I'm going to kick ass in those three to six months. This is my goal. This is my endurance running goal, my podcasting goal, my breakdancing goal. And what is it that matters to me? What do I want to learn? What do I want to do? What, not, not what does a job want me to do? But what do I want to do? Because this should be an opportunity. You know, this period of time is almost like a God-given sabbatical. The, uh, it's just an opportunity to say, here's what I care about. And I get to do it. And fortunately enough, I get to get paid to do it because you get unemployment benefits. Not a lot. And certainly not for many people, not enough to really live on and thrive on. Uh, in certain states, it's particularly bad. But if you're in a certain position, and again, unemployment is different for everybody. You got a millionaire who's decided to retire, who's unemployed, and you've got you know, a single mother of six who's, who's working two jobs and COVID hit and she's unemployed. Two very, very different experiences. So I, I don't speak for all, but for many in the middle, the answer is what matters to you? What are you going to commit to? Like you said, Lewis, what is going to be the thing you, you really keep to and you prove to the world that you can do? And how are you going to tell that story? That's fantastic. What are you going to say, Kyle? I was just going to say, like, you were given that God-given sabbatical and you took it and you ran with it. And like, I, I think that it's interesting that you've kept that same mindset about this period of time. And you look at it in, in like you, a, a positive light as something that people can take advantage of. And, you know, that shows through you, that shows through what you've done. And I, I just think it's really cool that you're working on this product for those people in a position where usually people look at it as a negative thing, like, ew, you know, like that's not right or whatever, but it, it's something that you look at as a good thing. And, and that's interesting. And one of yeah. the things I think that you did uh, to develop your spike while you were on that sabbatical is, is networking and is meeting as many people as you could and going to conferences and, and getting podcasts, people on your podcast. So what do you think about networking as being that spike? And, and what advice would you give to someone who is starting from not knowing anyone? Like, like how do you practically go about meeting as many people as possible and making it as impactful as possible? So going back a minute to where you started the question, you said that most people look at it, this is a really negative time and I'm looking at this as a positive time. And in his book, Zero to One, Peter Thiel talks about how he asks every candidate who joins any of his organizations one question and that question mm -hmm. is what do you believe about the world that nobody else believes what do you believe to be true my belief is very simple at this period of time is that unemployment is a really good thing for many people unemployment is a really big opportunity so that's my different belief and that's where that comes from to answer your second question about networking nobody knows nobody you said what if you're starting from nowhere yeah. the answer is you're not it doesn't matter where you are it doesn't matter if you if you're an 18 year old who you know, worked at a mechanic for the last couple of years and you're trying to get into a, a new industry, you've got a client, you've got a, a boss, you've got a random, your neighbors, everybody knows somebody. The second thing you said is networking as the spike. Networking is not the spike. Networking is the way to either define what your spike will be mm -hmm. or to share the story of your spike. Going around saying, I'm the world's greatest networker is not a spike. Going around saying, I am using my network to share something or learn something helps you develop the spike. So in terms of networking, I think there's a couple things. The first is you've got to give in order to get. One of our great users, his name is Doug Ellerbrock. He's awesome. He's so positive. Numerous people have separately told me how positive he's been for them. We did a time well spent. We have this video series called Time Well Spent where we interview unemployed people about their experiences. And he talks about how every single day almost he's reaching out to people and he's setting up calls with people, people he's never heard of people have never heard of him. And they set up 30 minutes and they just chat. And his question is always, what are you looking for and how can I help? This guy has been out of work for, for five or six months. He spent 27 years at bed, bath and beyond 27 years at one company as a senior manager, 
you know, COVID hit, they restructured, they did a bunch of layoffs. He didn't take it harshly. He just said, hey, that's what happens. He's, he's you know, I guess in his late 50s, early 60s, 27 years of one company, and he is going around to people saying, what can I do for you? That was a very powerful question. A very power, the, the question of, or, or the realization that it is not about you is a very re important realization. He has that. So when you're networking, try to figure out what is it that you can do for other people. That's why personally, I use the, my podcast as a cheat code. Because my answer was, what can I do for you? Well, I'm going to put you on a podcast. I'm going to share your story with at least the dozens of people who are listening. You know, maybe occasionally a hundred back then. So that was, that was my, what can I do for you? For other people, it's a little bit different. For some people, it doesn't really go anywhere. But starting with that question is really important. So that's that one-to-one -one side. You know, reach out. Don't be afraid. My, uh, a friend was telling me about a colleague who just reached out to like, or was even thinking about reaching out to an executive at their company. And she had said, this is the bravest thing I've ever done. And I don't, you know, maybe I responded too harshly, but that shouldn't be the bravest thing you've ever done. You should reach out to anybody and everybody who piques your interest. And you should say, hi, uh, Mr. Or Mrs. Crazy Executive, who I would never even imagine would ever talk to me. Here's what I can do for you. I would love 15 minutes and see what your hit rate is. So that's on the individual side. Then you've got groups, organizations. There's a million organizations that devoted their entire company to making networking possible very well and very in a group. The two that we work with closely at Riveter are Ivy, the social university, and Brunchwork. They put together incredible events with CEOs, with leaders, with all these people. And they put together these events and make it very easy to connect with other people in a group setting. There's a million others. There's Lunch Club AI. There's local groups. If you're in Dallas, there's Career DFW. If you are maybe more of a blue collar worker, you go to your city workforce development group and they'll put you in networking groups. So you can network individually or you can network in groups. But 85% of jobs come from networking. There's this hidden job market people like to talk about, which is things that are not posted. There's even the jobs that are posted are almost always going to go to the person who reached out to the hiring manager or someone else at the company or whatever. You've got to network. And you've got to do it on both cylinders, individually, one-to-one, -one, message somebody who seems cool, ask them for 15 minutes, tell them what you can do for them. And in a group setting where you're learning about a lot of people, you're identifying, you've got your eye on the people who matter to you, and then you go get them and make them part of your team. Another option, one thing that I did you know, a few years ago when I was unemployed is I started a newsletter and everybody I met, I added to my newsletter and it was my personal newsletter. Uh, my podcast was called Adriel's Curious City. The newsletter had the same thing. And that was, here's what's going on with me. Here's what I found interesting this week. Here's what I, I would love if anybody could help me with this. Here's a good book I read. And the engagement was incredible. I mean, it was, it started with my friends and family. It grew into a few people I worked with. By the end of it, there were like 300 people, most of them I met once at a conference or something, who were opening at a rate of like 70% reading it, responding it to me. And they were all on my sort of like personal cheer squad. They were there for me. And that's just another option for you to make your, your networking successful. That's awesome. And I think another point that you didn't bring up there is how like intentional you were about it. So Kyle and I read this article you put on LinkedIn where you kind of told the story in greater detail, but you made it like a goal to set like 30 hours a week of networking. You had a specific target. So whether that's you know, five of those 15 minute coffee dates a week or one podcast interview per week or one long form interview or one group event, setting those specific metrics is a way to do it. And this is something I wanted to bring up earlier uh, when we were doing that discussion about, you know, what should you be doing while you're unemployed to increase your value to the world and get that unique skill set. And I think, you know, unemployed means you're not formally employed, but it doesn't mean you can't like apply some discipline and rigor to your pursuit of whatever that alternative thing is. So, you know, for you, when you're telling that story and what your thing was, was 30 hours a week of very intentional, this amount of coffee dates, this amount of group activities, if it's to bring it back to, you know, if it's the break dancing, if it's the art, if it's the cooking show you're starting, you know, holding yourself accountable and learning to work as your own boss in the sense of, you know, like, being accountable to putting out a set amount of intentional effort towards whatever pursue is going to be a great way to like increase the success of any of those. And that's reflected in the strategy you took and some of the, the things you're talking about. So again, in terms of reframing 
unemployment as a period of time, I would like to add it to, you know, from positive or negative to positive, but also like unemployed doesn't mean not working. It just means not working a job for someone else. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you talked about rigor and discipline. You got to imagine, I don't know, 40, 50% of the people who lose their jobs at any given point are type A personalities, they're go-getters, they're career people, they're crushing it at the office. And then all of a sudden that disappears. Finding that discipline is incredibly, incredibly important to their self-esteem, to their uh, ability to succeed in this period, to a lot of different things. There's two you know, quotes who basically say the same thing and basically from the same kind of person to apply. John Doerr, the venture capitalist who backed Google and, and many others, he wrote a book, but it's called What Gets Measured Gets Managed. His book was called Measure What Matters. His quote is, what gets measured gets managed. The things you write down that you are going to measure your ability to meet, that's what's going to get managed. The other one is from Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator. And uh, this was more of a paraphrase, but he says, it's amazing how you can watch a metric grow just by watching it. Meaning, yeah. meaning if you're not looking at something, it's going to be stale. It's not going to be great. But all of a sudden, when you start writing it down saying every week I need to do two, I have to network with two people. I have to. Just by saying, did I network with two people or not? Yes or no? All of a sudden, you're going to find that you're going to start networking with two people. You know, and that's a startup thing too. Like we're, we do this at Riveter where we've had one goal. It's been the most important goal. And our one goal has been growth, free user growth. And we started measuring this maybe uh, six-ish weeks ago, seven weeks ago, six weeks ago. And we went all the way back and we looked at our user growth and it was all over the place. One week it was 8%, one week it was 3%. One week, it was all over the place. And we said, what we're going to do, we're going to measure it, and we're going to go for 10% growth every single week. For the last five weeks, since we launched that, we've been growing an average of 14% a week consistently. The That's lowest amazing. was 11, the highest was 17. And just by measuring it, all of a sudden it became a focus. But now, we're not measuring other things. And other parts need to be improved. Our email open rate has gone down because it hasn't gotten enough love. We haven't added enough partners. To that. So now we need to measure those things. Are we adding one partner per week? Are our email open rates over X percentage? What gets measured gets managed. It's true in business. It's true in personal, personal business, unemployment. It's true in pretty much, it's true in diet. It's true in exercise. And what gets measured gets managed is, is a, an important system for anybody trying to improve at anything. Yeah. The other thing I'd add there in terms of, you know, having those personal KPIs, but the other thing is about like the lifestyle. So one thing I've kind of adopted in the quarantine, because there's a lot of similarities between quarantine and unemployment where it's a great period of unexpected bursts of free time. And it's like, how do I use that productively? And one thing I've been saying to myself that's been really helpful is, you know, if I can wake up early to work for someone else, I can wake up early to work for myself and do things I want to do. So to know you have a job and you have no issue. You know, I was working at a uh, vehicle manufacturing plant, the Mercedes plant in Tuscaloosa, building cars, or I wasn't building cars. That's what happens there. Uh, waking up at 5 a.m. to work there. And, you know, I was excited to work. There's a great opportunity, but it wasn't, you know, what I most want to be doing in that moment. And then it's like, I went back to school, lived the rest of my life a year later. It's like, if I have now started realizing, you know, I, just something I was, you know, like it was a day in that day out job. I didn't like want to be there with my whole heart every day uh, versus doing something like this podcast where it's like one of my favorite things to do. I can, it's a project I chose that I got to make the rules for. And if I can wake up to do something I'm not eager to do, uh, I can wake up to do something I've designed for myself and like living day in and day out like that. It's been extremely productive for me. What's one of the hard things for you about doing that? Because I find that if someone else told you to do it, it's great. Someone else told you to do it. You kind of know what you got to do. You're getting paid for it or somehow measured and you'll go do it. When it's your own thing, it's is this really, am I right? Did I choose the right thing? Am I, am I spending in the right way? What's difficult for you guys about doing what you said? You know, either you wake up and work for someone else or you wake up and work on your own thing. What's the challenge? What's the flip side of that? Kyle's got something locked yeah. up. Right? My problem is, is just that, is just that, that I may, if I make the rules, then I can wake up four hours later if I want to. Like, it, it, there's no penalty. So why not just do it when I want to do it? Because I make the rules. And that's why, this is a good thing, you know, like that's why making me unroll your own rules is a good thing because you can do what you want, but that doesn't end up being true because when you only ever do what you want, you end up not getting things done and you have to, you have to play the game in every domain kind of the same way. I think where you're constantly doing things that you're not eager to do in the moment 
and if you're not doing that then you're not growing and i don't know i think you're you're not on the path to where you want to be if you're not doing things that you are not eager to do all the time yeah i'd say for me the toughest part is the the social basis so you know i'm living with the same group of roommates i was at that job two years ago same apartment same city whatever same group of guys and they'd see me going to bed eight and it's like all right eight o'clock brush my teeth go to sleep because i was waking up 4 35 to go and work out do work whatever and they're like, we understand that. That's fine. And now it's like a weeknight or whatever it is. And I'm I'm like, well, I got to wake up early tomorrow because that's the schedule I want to work at. And they're like, well, for what? I'm like, you know, this podcast that's not making any money yet for, or to work on my classes, which, you know, whatever. It's just that's the lifestyle I've found that has led me to be most effective at dealing with things that, you know, not eager to do in the moment that are high impact and move the needle in terms of making progress on on long term goals. And like, why are you going to bed? We want to do something fun. And it's like, well, this is as important to me as that was. Like, there's no immediate consequence of failure. You know, I'm not going to get a, a call from a manager and lose like a highly sought after position at a company, but I am going to feel like crap about myself. And I'm going to probably have less things get done and not in the long term, like have aggregated the net output I've wanted to put together. Uh, and they've gotten, honestly, that was a very temporary, I mean, it's still some friction, but seeing me do it like day in and day out for a couple of weeks, they're like, okay, that's clearly important to you. And like, they, they, they come to respect it for sure. But that's yeah. still the most difficult piece of it. Yeah. I mean, for each one of you, the response is slightly different, I guess for Kyle, totally get it, man. It's well, I set an alarm for seven, but what's the difference if it's 10? Like really what's, <laughs> what's, who's going to stop me? Like Lewis is going to yell at me because I told him I'll get it done by noon. It'll be two o'clock. No one cares. Setting, you talked about setting rules and setting those rules, setting those parameters is super important right? Saying it's my thing, but I got to be my own manager and, and shit, I'm going to be a strict manager. I'm going to say if my deadline was, was Tuesday at noon, I better get it done by Tuesday at noon. And if not, I'm in some sort of trouble. I'm not getting dessert tonight or whatever the thing is like, you got to set your own rules. And Lewis, that never ends, man. My friends are, are all, I had a very controversial LinkedIn post this week where I, cause we had a, a debate this weekend about whether it's, you know, whether, whether it's, we're talking about work-life balance. They all work in, uh, you know, big law or in like really big, difficult, strenuous jobs. And they're working. I got a friend who's working insane hours and Saturday nights, Sunday nights, people are calling him, sending him emails. He's got to check it every second. He's got to leave a dinner. Like he's working incredibly hard and, and he enjoys that like super rigorous lifestyle. And I'm working in a different way, but certainly not the same number of hours, certainly not the same number of rigor or the same stakes. But for me, it's like, if I'm with friends, I'm going to be 110% with friends because this is my lifestyle that I designed and I'm my own manager. And I said, hey, I got my stuff done for the day. I get to be with friends. And the debate is always the same thing that you're having, Lewis. It's, Adriel, you're not really working. No one's paying you anything. You're your own boss. So why don't you just come hang out? Because right now we're free. And the answer needs to be, well, I'm not because I set a rule for myself and you're always going to get trash talked. I had this LinkedIn post where I wrote, I had an interesting conversation with my friends and they work at big law. And they said that, you know, you got to work these crazy hours and it's okay to do it for somebody else because by the time you get to your thirties or forties, then you'll be able to be working for someone else still, but like at a much chiller pace. And I said, well, that's not for me they're doing really well and they love it. And I'm sure they will be wealthier and more successful than I in that capacity. But that's not for me. For me, it's, I like going for a walk in the afternoon or I like, you know, when I'm with a friend, I don't want to check my email and I don't want to worry about checking my email. So I had this post that said like, which one is right? What do you guys think about? And one of them saw it, sent it in our group thread, got really mad at me facetiously, <laughs> call, called me a bunch of names. And then we talked about whether or not it's, it's okay to pick a lifestyle, which lifestyle is right. People on the LinkedIn post commented on the one hand, like, nope, you've got to be doing your 80, 90 hour weeks in your twenties. Cause you've got to put in the time. Then some other people said like, it's all right, craft your life, work on your priorities, figure out what the three things are, the three levers you need to pull in order to have the best life possible. Make sure you pull those and make sure they're your own levers, not somebody else's. So it, it created an interesting debate. And, and if this is anywhere near the lifestyle you choose, you're going to be having, and your friends do anything else, you're going to be having similar debates for a very long time to come. Perfect. <laughs> One tool, I don't know if we'll get into it in this episode, but Kyle and I have been playing around with another tool developed by the same guys, the 75 Hard, who, which is that fitness challenge, which has been really helpful for managing these kind of things for us. I don't know if we should get into it now or not. It's called the Powerless. 
No, probably not. Don't, don't tease yeah. it. Just say what it is. <laughs> then we're going to get into it like in long form at some point. I'm just like, I know I'm going to hit that. On the edge of my seat. Yeah, I'm going to hit that 100-day streak, and then we're going to have to do a long form episode on it. So we'll do a little teaser here. Uh, so Kyle and I just released on Tuesday of this week. So that will inform the viewers of the discrepancy between me making this comment and them hearing this episode when it's published and they learn our lead time behind the scenes. But the 75 hard was that 75 day fitness, mental toughness challenge. You do six things every single day. If you miss one of them, you start back at day zero designed by podcaster, Andy Frisella. He puts out another system. I explained it super quickly because we've explained it in a lot of content called the power list, which is borrowing the same concept of 75 hard where you know, you have a list of things that you do every single day. It's a successful day if you do them all. It's a fail day. You have a permanent record of your temporary laziness if you do not do those things. And you write down, you know, a list, preferably the day before, uh, of the five things that you need to do that day, that following day. Uh, do all five things, and then it's a win. Or if you don't get them all done before you go to bed, it's a loss. You know what I mean? And if you want to, quote unquote, win at life, you know, it would make sense that you'd expect a winner at life to win more days than they lose because in, in any game where there's a concept of win and loss, winners win more than they lose. They score more points than the other team. The number of wins outpaces the number of L's. Three versus two, four out of four versus three out of a week of seven days. The idea is, you know, if you can just win the day, it's a successful, it's a successful way. And, you know, you tally up at the end of the year, how many of the days did I win? Uh, he put out this other one, like, called the last thousand days. And he's like, are you at where you want to be at in life? It's like, okay, well, look at the past thousand days. How many of those, uh, knowing your capacity, knowing what your goals were, were days where you would consider them wins? You know, was that two days a week you met capacity, produced at a reasonable level of production based on where you want to be in life? Was that one day a week? Was that five days a week? And if it's not something kind of towards that more than half, well, more than half range, like why are you at all surprised that you're where you're at? And it's also like, well, looking forward, you know, going where you want to go a thousand days from now, like if you're not planning on winning five days a week, you're not actually planning on achieving the things you're planning on achieving. So I've been following this for, I guess, 23 days now in a row, five things every day. And again, it doesn't have to, it's not about doing the more. This is what inspired me to bring this up was, you know, the conversation with the roommates and the social pressure. It's not about doing more. This list isn't about helping me get more things done than I was already doing. It's about prioritization, right? The one finding those one thing. So what are the things that are most likely to lead to moving the needle on the projects I'm working on and like actually high impact. So if Kyle and I don't have any podcasts lined up, that would, some of those things would definitely be cold outreach networking to try to get more interviews on the schedule. Some of those things can be things you're already doing and just lead up, need a little bit more motivation. So the workouts I've been doing, the, the stretching towards the middle split has seen an appearance on a couple of the days uh, and then just whatever else needs to get done. So however you need to structure it to make progress towards your life. But it's been a very helpful framework for me. And then it's a version of, it's a version of Archimedes lever with a yep. long enough lever. You can move the world. You exactly. just got to define what your lever is or what your five levers are. And you're not moving the world. You're moving yourself in the direction you want yeah. to do it. But picking your one thing, your five things, your whatever things saying, these are my things. And I'm going to kick ass at these things and everything else is noise. Yep. And then with, with my roommates, you know, I explained, they've, I've explained the concept. Uh, and so it's like, on the, if I get all my things done, it's pretty much like, okay, it's whatever, five o'clock, let's go do something fun. And if it's not, I'm like, okay, well, I have this list. You understand how the list works. The list isn't done yet. And so on days where the list isn't done, they kind of let me finish my stuff. And on the days where it is, they're excited to like, go do something fun and have me be a part of it. So that's, that's my tip for the day. This is monologue in this episode. I like it. I think there's a lot to gain from it. I actually took a note. I think something like that would be really awesome for unemployed people. You know, we talked about managing your time. Uh, and the answer is you've got to do certain things every day. You got to network. You got to take a walk. You got to connect with somebody, uh, you, whatever else there is. It's, uh, it, it's a cool tool. It's been a helpful framework for me. And that you don't necessarily have to apply that same framework of failure, fear uh, of, okay, you're at a 23 day streak. Like if you go to zero, you go to zero. But I've kind of, you know, that's how I usually take things. And it's like, if I don't hit 100, I mean. Yeah, like, Lewis is just crazy, everyone. <laughs> also, like today, one of my things is water. I, I want to drink a gallon of water. I've been sick. I need water. And it's, uh, it's not a hard thing. It's not something that, like, I'm going to fail at. Or, like, I'm, I'm not setting the bar too far out, you know. But at the end of the day, when I have drank a gallon of water and I know that I completed that and I checked that off, like, that means something to me that I, I set 
something. Uh, I said I'm going to do something and then I did it. And doing that day in and day out with different things, like, it's just, it's very powerful. It really is. Um, yeah, I used to use a similar app called Way of Life, where it was the same thing. I think I paid three or five dollars for it. And I said, these are the things I want to do. I want to drink eight cups of water a day. I want to sweat every day. I want to read every day, whatever else there was. And and you just checked them and saw you saw your metrics over time. Completely. I think uh, we should transition now to the bonus round, some kind of free form discussion, some quick, quick questions for you about different topics. I want to start out by asking you about kind of this upcoming trip you have planned. Uh, you've kind of set yourself on this adventurous course with, for, over the next six to eight months. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So my fiance and I, her name's Abby. We live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, she works at Pinterest. Pinterest recently announced that they are going to be working from home until August. Uh, Riveter basically follows Pinterest HR dictums, is what she told me. So, <laughs> so we, we work from home until uh, next August as well. And we uh, thought it'd be very, very fun to take advantage of this time and, and go on a little adventure. So we're going on a road trip and we are going to six to eight different cities for a month each for six to eight months at a time. We're starting off in Los Angeles, going to San Diego, Arizona, Austin, New Orleans, and depending on if we want to keep it going or make our way home, we the Carolinas, then Birmingham. north to Michigan, Wyoming, whatever else. And I'm, I'm very excited for it. I think it'll be interesting, fun, a great way to spend time. But this comes to sort of my singular perspective in COVID, which is the following. This is a pretty crazy time for everybody. And... This is a time that our children will be writing book reports about and they will have a history assignment in fourth grade where they come home to you and they say, hey, daddy, today we're learning about the great pandemic of 2020. Can you tell me about it for my book report? And can I record you on my neuro micro device or whatever? And they're going to ask questions like, where were you? And you're going to say Tuscaloosa or San Francisco uh, or moved in with my parents, whatever the answer is. They're going to say, what did you do? And some people are just going to answer, well, it was really terrible. I, you know, maybe I lost my job. Maybe I was sick. Maybe I, I somebody I know was a love got sick. Maybe I, I was depressed. A lot of bad things. And your kid's going to write that up in a book report and say, my daddy was in a great pandemic in 2020 and it was the shittiest part of his life. Or, and this is important, or you're going to say, yes, son, it was really shitty. It was really hard. But here's what I did. Here's the interesting thing that I took this time and turned myself into. I, my buddy and I, we started a podcast and we had a full 10 listeners an episode or whatever, whatever we're getting to 10 million listeners an episode, somewhere in between. My, my fiance and I, we traveled the country and I started a company. I, I, you know, was laid off and I cleaned up trash in my neighborhood every single freaking day. And then all of a sudden one person, then five people, then 20 people, Forrest gumped me and they followed me around the city cleaning up trash. I don't care what it is, but your kid, when they ask you, what did you do in the great pandemic of 2020? I'm writing a history report on it. You better have a good answer. So in that framework, when, when Abby and I were talking about what are we doing, what matters to us, what do we want to make out of this time? We were supposed to have this great Euro trip trap planned. We were supposed to be in Russia and France and then uh, use that as an opportunity to basically quit our jobs and explore Europe. That was canceled. So we said, you know what? We are going to have an amazing time. We are going to do something interesting. We are going to explore the country. And we are going to tell that to our children in their book report. So the all-American digital nomad. <laughs> living, the, living the life, man. And oh. listen, fortunate enough to be able to do so. Fortunate enough to, to have the means, to have the health, to have everything you need to have to be lucky enough to be able to spend your time in that way and, and count my blessings every day on it. But also recognize that a lot of other people are similarly fortunate, are similarly enabled, are similarly capable, some even more so, and they will not. And travel is not for everyone. Not everyone needs to do my thing, but many people will not. And their book report, their kid's book report is going to read, my mommy or my daddy had the worst fucking year. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, that people who have interesting bi biographies think like that. You know, so what, what are some of the most interesting biographies that you've ever read? One of the first biographical series I ever read was everything Richard Branson put out, 
like a virgin, losing my virginity, like his whole virgin series. Richard Branson's a maniac. He's a weirdo. He does, he's all about different, not better. So everything that he puts out is kind of my first exposure to biographies in, in middle school and high school. My favorite of the last few years was the biography of Andy Grove. Andy Grove was one of like the founders of Grove, G-R-O-V, was one of the founders of Silicon Valley. He's got a crazy story, Hungarian refugee, parents fled Nazis, came with nothing, paid his way through Brooklyn College, moved out to California, started Intel, he was one of the most famous tech CEOs of all time, one of the busiest people of all time, and always, always, always taught as a professor. Fascinating story, incredible persona. Um, so high, it's very long, very thick, but really incredible book that I gifted to numerous people. And then on the slightly lighter side, they call me Supermensch, is the biography, the autobiography of Shep Gordon. Shep Gordon, his basic story was he was a Long Island Jewish guy, basically a bum who liked to do drugs and listen to music, moved out to California in order to do drugs and listen to music, was selling drugs to everybody in the hotel he was at. One day he's downstairs at the pool and he's smoking pot with Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin. And they go, hey, you're Jewish, right? Well, we're looking for a manager. Will you be our manager? He said yes. And that led him to become one of the most influential celebrity music and chef managers in, in the history of the industry. And he's, it's a weird book. It's a funny book. But, you know, it's all about being different, saying yes to opportunities. And it's a much, much lighter read. Mike Myers also, for those who don't like to read, Mike Myers made a documentary called The Same Thing. They call me Supermensch about his story. Yeah, speaking of uh, saying yes to opportunities and being willing to, uh, to do stuff like that, I potentially advised, since our last call about a week ago, signed up for a marathon, my first one, seven weeks out. I had a buddy who I've been running with casually on his short runs of his training plan. He's like, you know what? You're in similar shape to me. You sure you don't want to do the whole thing? And I'm like, you know what? My kids are going to ask me what I did during the quarantine. <laughs> You're going to run a marathon. That's awesome. Uh, you do have some background. I brought some props for this question from, from the sides of all the, all the things around me. What tips do you have for endurance running? As a former Ironman completer. <laughs> so the, I, I remember going for a run with a friend. He, he started running maybe five years ago, was very overweight, did a couch to 5K program, like loved it, fell in love with the running, did 5Ks, 10Ks. And then I ran his first half marathon with him. And we went on some training runs about the Bay Area. And he always listened to music. Uh, he always had headphones in. I've never run with music. Always just ran just in my own head. And we're on a run once and he's listening to whatever he's listening to, probably just uh, Mario soundtracks on repeat, knowing him. And he's like, Adriel, like, aren't you bored? Like, you're doing eight, 10, 13 mile runs. You're running a marathon. You're doing a half Ironman or a full, an Ironman. And it's like, you know, seven hours of work. Aren't you bored? And what I told him was, I just use it as a time to check it on myself, to breathe a lot, to work on a problem through my head. So my tip that doesn't work for everyone, I think for most people, it doesn't work but it's to try to do it without music and without books. It's to use that time where it's you and your body pushing yourself to an extreme that most people do not touch to understand your physical body better and to also build the ability to long form think on a problem. Now, I, I had to stop running recently due to a, a knee injury, but for the decade that I loved running and I wasn't great at it, but I loved it and I loved going far, I would try to assign myself a problem for that run. And as much time as I could, I would focus on that problem. And it's very difficult because all of a sudden your mind goes somewhere else or you think you solved it or, or you get bored or whatever. But so my advice would be, see if it works for you, but build the ability to work on a singular problem in, on your own in the long form, because that'll help you when you're just sitting on your desk working on a problem, not get distracted. That'll help you when you're working, uh, reading a book or having a conversation with somebody. The ability to long form singularly focus is a very important skill. And I think running is a great opportunity to work on that. All right. Well, I'm doing a, a half marathon tomorrow. So <laughs> is it a real half marathon with a lot of people? Or are you like just running 13 miles and tracking it kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So no, no support crew. Right before this call, I went to Dick's and bought $20 worth of goo. <laughs> so love goo. yeah, I love goo. Oh, the other, the other tip is uh, make sure after any race, you cool down properly. After my Ironman, I crushed my goals. I was so happy with my time. And they didn't have like, you know, they should give you like a heat blanket or something after that. They just didn't have that. 
So whatever, my friends are there, we hang out, I, we're having a good time, we go out to eat, we drive home for three hours, Abby and I lay on the couch, we're hang- I'm just so like exhausted and amped, we're laying on the couch, we're watching a movie, we get up, she gets up, I get up, my leg freezes, and then all of a sudden, in the span of 15 seconds, my body goes into shock. And for about seven to 10 minutes, I was convinced I was gonna die. My body temperature dropped so low, uh, my body was shaking, and that period of like laying on the couch put my body in a shock. She was on the phone with the hospital. We were trying to, it was awful. And it was all because you didn't cool, I didn't cool down properly. So screw my last advice about being a long form thinker. That was nonsense. Cool down properly. <laughs> so just take like a long, slow walk for like a couple of 25 minutes or? Long, slow walk, put on sweatpants, change out of your sweaty clothes, basic stuff. Don't be an idiot like your pal Adriel. Don't do it. Check. I will be running 13 miles tomorrow, so I'll, that's another idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the warm. I'll, I'll I'll do the cool down and the warm up for my workout. So the, the question I have for you is: in, in the last call we had, you brought up how you've in the past, which people have learned a little bit about your past from listening this far, uh, have kind of juggled a lot at once, uh, versus now you're really singular focused. Can you explain kind of what that dynamic's been like and why you're doing this? And now the benefits of when to be kind of that multi focus versus when you think that singular focus and your experience? Sure. So I think there's, so in the past, I always did a lot of things. You know, right after college, I was working on two startups. I was teaching at the university. I had a podcast. While I was working my last job at the self-driving car company. I had the job, I had a podcast and I was leading an event series and I was heavily training in athletics. I always had a lot of things going. Now I'm singularly focused on Riveter and it's the first time in my life. I kind of have this podcasting thing on the side, but I'm singularly focused on Riveter, and that's new to me. And my thinking is this. I think there's two times in life in which you need to do, you need to juggle. And the first is when your main thing is for somebody else. When your main thing is making somebody else's dream come true, you should have things happening on the side that are all your own. They don't have to be monetizable. They don't have to be startups. They can be just a coloring book that you want to finish. I don't care what it is, but being committed to things that are all your own while most of your time is being spent on somebody else's dream is very important. The second time is I think in, in youth or in later age, but in the exploratory phase of your life. When you're not sure of your direction, when you're not convinced of what you wanna be doing, being able to have multiple long-term experiments happening at the same time is really valuable. And for me, that was incredibly helpful because in the beginning, shortly after graduating college and I wasn't sure exactly what I would be doing, it was important to me to have one foot in this transportation delivery space, which obviously paid off because I later worked in transportation and self-driving cars and delivery. I had one foot in the outdoor space, which became incredibly important to me and the startup we were working on was super, I was super passionate about it. I was teaching at a university, which was incredibly important to me and interesting. And I learned how to teach, how to speak, how to communicate how to plan a lesson, all that stuff. And doing all these different things, as I was exploring and I wasn't 110% committed to any of them, made me better at all of them. They all overlapped. I would teach, or I would have a problem in the startup I was working on. I would talk about my problem in the class I was teaching. They would help me solve it. Or my second startup would help me solve the problem my first. Or the podcast I was doing, I'd get to interview somebody. I wanted to be a customer and an investor. They all overlapped. The reason I decided to cut that stuff out is that now I found something that is all my own, that is something I believe in passionately, and I want to jump off the cliff without a parachute and see how it'll go. And if I, every minute I take away from making Riveter come true in the way I want it to is a minute I'm taking away from my future self because this is the thing I'm fully dedicated to and I finally found it and took a lot of experimentation to get there. So that's why I think juggling can be incredibly valuable. And even now, I'm sure I would benefit if I was still you know, hosting events or had a podcast and interview people. I'm sure it would be a benefit. But I want to make sure everything I do is in the benefit of Riveter solely because I'm taking a big swing here. If I miss, that's okay. I'll, you know, a year from now, if Riveter doesn't work out, I'll reset, I'll think it through, I'll go back to juggling until I'm ready to understand the next thing. But if I hit, it's going to be a big hit I'm putting all my weight behind it. Man, good answer. I think that's a good place for us to end. Andrea, where would you send people to, to find you, to support you, to learn more about you? What's your, what's your call to action for you? Yeah, so I made it easy. I am at a Lubarski 2 anywhere on the internet, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. 
uh, email as well. Uh, Riveter is Riveter Works anywhere on the internet. Our website, RiveterWorks.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, we're Riveter Works everywhere. My call to action is not about me. It's not about Riveter, but it's about you. Take this time after you listen to this. Take five minutes. Do it on a walk. Do it with a cup of coffee. Do it talking to a friend. Take five minutes and think about what are you going to do to make yourself spiky? What are you going to do to stand out? What is the thing that you care about that nobody else cares about that is uniquely your own? And make your plan to try to do it. Fantastic. Well, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Thank you, guys. This was fun. That was a great conversation with Adriel, learning to, uh, learning from him about what they're doing at Riveter, uh, trying to help people while they're unemployed to, to gain access to, to benefits, kind of the HR department for unemployed people. I think it's a, a really cool idea, and it's a great time to have started that, right? Right in the middle of the pandemic. Absolutely. I completely agree. Super fun guest to have on. I'm going to was looking through some of the stuff I need to list in the show notes. He made a lot of great recommendations of books to check out, some cool frameworks for, you know, when you should be juggling multiple projects or when you should just be focusing on one thing. Um, so I'm going to have to re-listen to it myself when I edit this. And there's just a lot of value to impact. So I'm super grateful we were able to have him on. I hope you all enjoyed listening to it. And if you did and you want to support Kyle and I and encourage us to make more content like this and connect with more people like Adriel, please give us feedback in the form of a rating or review on iTunes or send us a message on social media. You can find us on all major platforms and likely we'll respond. So thanks so much for listening and we'll see you in a week with the next episode. Thank you.